Run it up, then run it back. Run it up, then run it back. Run it up, then run it back. Woo! Happy Monday morning, y'all. Welcome to Run It Back on FanDuel TV. And what a weekend in sports it was. I mean, we could just sit here for the, I don't know, entire hour. Talk about WrestleMania, obviously, number one. Uh, oh, yes, and college basketball. And Shams running around getting scoops in the college game for us, which we'll get to here in a little while. Uh, but we did have a lot of NBA action. Guys, the Bucks told y'all. It's over. It's dead. It's done. They lose to New York. Fourth straight game. They've lost six of their last seven. Jalen Brunson with, you know, 43. Dante DiVincenzo with 26. Giannis did have 28, but they did lose Middleton uh, early. He got hit in the mouth. So I ask you, Shams, before we get to some of this action on the court, what, what's going on in that organization right now? This It feels like a bit of a spiral. Doc Rivers, the players, coaches, everyone said it publicly and privately. Like, these losses, three in a row, they lose to subpar teams last week and then last night against the Knicks. Like you said, Michelle, four losses in a row, six of their last seven. This is the final week of the regular season. They've all said these losses are unacceptable. And they are trying to work through these issues. They know they have a lot to fix to, to play as one unit, play as one team. I'm told on Saturday, Doc Rivers called for a team film session that included nine of their top rotation players Veteran okay. guys, that includes Giannis Antetokounmpo, Damian Lillard, Chris Middleton, Brooke Lopez, Malik Beasley, Bobby Portis, Patrick Beverly, Pat Connaughton, Jay Crowder, and all of them went one by one to speak their mind, essentially, and talk through the issues that this team is facing, this team is dealing with, with just four games left in the regular season, and then the playoffs. Yes, they're still the number two seed after all this. We know all the ups and downs this team has gone through. Coaching change of Adrian Griffin, bringing in Doc Rivers. This team is, is under 500 in the Doc Rivers era. And one source told me it's only the start of these tough and necessary conversations that this team has to have. It starts with health. Last night, even Chris Milton going down uh, after getting a tooth knocked out. They haven't been able to consistent, consistently keep their big three on the floor. But even still, Doc Rivers said we can't lose these games even when players are in and out of the lineup. So the expectations were heightened. The moment they got Damian Lillard and they're dealing with it now, and each day, it seems like they're having more and more of these conversations. So before we get to sort of where we think they are uh, as a team in the whole landscape, but what do you guys, what's your reaction to this idea of a, a film session and sort of a one-by-one, one, sounds like a town hall meeting is what it sounds like, Lou. Is that something that you would yeah. gather around? I've, I've, played, I've played for Doug before. He's one of those type of guys when, when there's some slippage there. He likes to get everybody in the room and, and be held accountable. And he likes to he likes to likes to teach on film. You know, that's one of his strong suits. And, you know, I just remember going through a lot of these moments when we had some slippage with the Clippers where, you know, we would get everybody in the room and, and discuss um, defense, defensive issues where we were on offense and trying to get everybody on the same page. You know, my my opinion with the Milwaukee Bucks team, you know, they had issues that predated Doc Rivers, right? That's how that job even became available. They were 30 and 13 um, when they fired Adrian uh, uh, Adrian Griffin. And, and you know, they still had some synergy issues. There still was, was some issues in them having that, that record. You know, I felt like that team was talented enough, you know, where they didn't need anybody to stand over there and coach. And so now that Doc is there and some of those issues still exist going into the playoffs, I think it's important for all of those guys to get on the same page. And, and here's something that's also interesting to me. I'm looking at the standings. It may be more of a better matchup for them to play Indiana than a Philadelphia team that just got a Joel and B back. So behind the scene, is there is there a situation where they might be playing um, a little chicken and trying to get a, a more favorable matchup? Who knows? Those are some of the games that teams play as well when it comes to this time of the season. But, you know, for me, with them being the team that they are, having guys that's won championships on this team, I would prefer them to be playing better basketball going into uh, the playoffs. So who knows what's going on in Milwaukee? Yeah, when, when you go on a big skid like this, there's always, you know, players only meetings, right? There's always extra <laughs> film sessions, just the whole morale, the mood and the facility is just not the same and it's pretty negative. So I'm, I'm not shocked by this, how 
Doc basically is making these team meetings with the guys that are on the floor, right? These are the guys that are going to be playing in the playoffs. These are the guys that got us in this hole. These are the guys that are going to get us out. So there's always different, uh, you know, meetings or film sessions or, you know, kind of all cards on deck. How do we fix this with the guys that are actually playing? So this doesn't surprise me at all, especially when you've lost three, of you know, you're three and seven in your last 10 games in the most critical part of the season before you get to playoffs where you're kind of now starting watching the the standings who can you play who's going to happen here but these are real issues and, and there were real issues with griff and these are real issues with doc and i think just they assumed that this they, they lost all the confidence in griff so let's make a change i don't even think it was necessarily a doc rivers thing it was they just needed someone different other than griffin and has it drastically improved and changed no, not really. There's been some nights where they've been more consistent. There's some nights where their offense is so good and their, their defense has stepped up. And I think initially when Doc took over, they started, you know, defending differently. Their coverages got different. Their terminology probably switched up a little bit, made things more simple. But this is a team with a lot of holes still on the defensive end. And this is a team where offensively, yeah, if they get going and they're healthy, they can be very, very good still. And are we panicking? Sure, because there's such a difference between the field and the Boston Celtics. But at the end of the day, they are still the second seed. At the end of the day, uh, they, they still have enough talent to get by in the playoffs and still make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. So uh, looking at their upcoming schedule, it's brutal. And whoever they play in the first round, whether it's Indy, Sixers, or the Heat, it's not going to be easy either way anyway. So I think no matter where they finish, 6, 7, 8, it's, it's, or 1, 2, 3, whoever finishes 6, 7, 8, it's going to be a dogfight for them. So let's go to the doc thing, right? Because for I didn't think that it was a doc issue. I thought something changed with the the vibe of this team when Giannis started talking about, oh, I got to make sure everybody else is bought in like I am. It felt like the seeds were planted there for him to leave at some point. And then we had all the coaching stuff and everything that went on after that. So, Lou, I, I don't know if you can put your finger on it. So why don't we just look at doc for one second? Was that the right move? If you could do the hindsight game right now, did they make a mistake in, in making the coaching change? My opinion to me, Doc is a proven coach. You know, if, if if you can have an opportunity to bring in a Doc Rivers caliber coach, you know, with the I don't know who was in the pool of coaches that they were even considering. But if you can bring in a caliber of coach of Doc with the talent that you have, I think you give yourself an opportunity. I think you give that you give that a look, you know, so I don't think there's any regrets there. And at the end of the day, like Chandler just said, they're still the second seed. They've had some slippage. There's been some issues throughout the course of this season for the Milwaukee Bucks. But through all of those things, they're still in a position to compete at a high level. So we don't know what the identity of this team is going to look like come to playoffs. We can criticize them all day long. And when the ball go up, the start of the playoffs, they can become a completely different basketball team and figure it out on the fly and, and get all of those things together that um, we've been criticizing them for. So I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the wrong move yet. I think we should wait, see how this thing play out, and then we give our opinions from there. It's also a call a spade a spade here. Losing Drew Holiday is huge. I don't care how good Damian Lillard is offensively, how much he can shoot it, how much on paper that sounds great, Damian Lillard <laughs> and Giannis. There's a reason that Grant Hill and there's a reason that all these guys on Team USA are making it a priority to go and get Drew Holiday for the freaking Olympic team. Like, he is that important. He is that good of a defender. He is that good of a setup guy and just a solid player that when you take that off any team, there's going to be a hole. And so I think that initially kind of spiraled their defensive woes and, and, and kind of had a trickle effect from there. But I think Doc, I think players, I've never played for him, Lou have, everything I know about him, he, he is, he's a proven guy, right? So he's got the resume, he's known, he's respected at least to where I think they thought, okay, let's bring this guy in, at least he can relate to these players, he can get along with these players, he can bring the best out of them right away, uh, do things that Griffin couldn't. So... Is it the right hire? Is it the wrong hire? I think it's too early to tell. Like Lou said, this team could turn it on and dominate whoever they play in the first round, second round, and then have a doozy of Eastern Conference Finals against the Celtics. They're that talented. They're that deep. Guys like Portis, Lopez, Connaughton, Giannis. Chris Middleton, I think, is key. Him going down, obviously, just got hit in the face, I think, so it's not going to be anything serious. But this team, they're like the Phoenix Suns. They have the firepower to be very, very scary. All right, yeah. so let's play that game for a second. They could do that. Go ahead, Lou. No, just to Chandler's point, I think that's the best point of all. When when you create culture and you win a championship with a certain group of guys, 
that's that may be more of the issue than anything that we're talking about besides doc and all of these things drew holiday being missing off of this basketball team that changes your identity that changes your culture on defense that changes everything that's been able to be successful for you and once you get rid of him and you have an opportunity at a damian lillard obviously you give that a serious look and that's what Milwaukee Bucks did. But, you know, right now when it comes to chemistry, chemistry and synergy and things like that, it looked like it's costing them right now. All right. So, Lou, let's let's just hypothetically. What is your gut telling you? Is Are you thinking that the Bucks go further than uh, expected? Or do you think it's more likely that we see a first round exit? No, I think. Looking at these teams around the East, I think the Bucks are still right there in the mix. I I think they're still one of the one of the teams that's going to give uh, the Boston Celtics the best run for their money, um, along with with New York and how they're playing. And it's just it's crazy to me that Philadelphia with Joel and B back in the mix is sitting right there at seven. They're going to shake up this playoff uh, playoff pitcher as well. Um, but I think they're still right there. I think they still give uh, Boston the biggest threat coming out of the East. Man, do you agree, Chandler? Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, the, the it's deep one through eight, but there, there's no powerhouse other than Celtics. Like right now, the Bucks. This Giannis said last night, this is the first four game losing streak since 2021. They're not used to this, so sure, our emotions running high right now. Are they frustrated? They're playing, and also they're losing to bad teams, which I think is really even sinking in more. But yeah, I like them against the Sixers and the Heat. I think it's gonna maybe go six or seven, but I like them. And then I like them in the second round against whoever else they decide to play. So again, they're so talented. They are that Phoenix Suns kind of team to me where if they do figure it out, they're still really, really, really good. But it's just, you don't wanna be talking about these type of, th we're talking about the coaching, if that's the right move, a week left yeah. in the regular season. Like this isn't where they wanna be just vibe wise and team morale wise, they want to be peaking. They want to be cruising right now to that first round matchup. And they're not, they're talking about Chris Middleton's out again. They're talking about his damn, do we mess up by the fire and Griff still is Dame, the, I mean, you know, like, there's still all these questions still and it's, it's April. That's not right. Yeah. Four games left. And we're having a conversation we had two months ago. <laughs> it feels a little bit weird to me right now. Let's go to the West for a minute because things are happening over there as well. They have been, it's been jumbled up in Clippers. Woo! 26 point comeback. That is kind of awesome. Third largest comeback in franchise history. Paul George had 23 of his 39 in the fourth, but we can talk a lot more of the Terrence man, Amir Coffee of it all, who hit some of the biggest shots. Um, it got the attention of one Bones Highland. People were paying attention to this game, but three straight, six of their last seven. That's what they've won, Chandler. We're over here talking about the Bucks not peaking at the worst possible time. What do you say about this Clippers team right now? Yeah, I mean, this is a big time win. And the fact that you, you hit it on the head, Terrence Mann and, <laughs> and her coffee, huge threes down the stretch. Now you can look at how did this happen? How did they get down so so deep here? The Cavs were up 80 to 59 at halftime, shooting 80% or 60% for the field and had 40 points first and second quarters. They went on 10-0, 6-0, and 8-0 runs, all separate in the second quarter and still somehow find a way to trick this game. So I think to me, it, it shows a lot. It shows that the, the Clippers can allow this to happen still, but are still a resilient, mature team that can come back. And Paul George was unbelievable, 39-11-7. and seven. He looked like prime Paul George, perfect from the free throw line, 16-16, which was also great. But the fact that they do have this deep team where Terrence Mann and Amir Coffey, they're the ones hitting the big shots down the stretch with Kawhi Leonard out is awesome. It comes back to me with James Harden, man. Like, why Kawhi Leonard's out. Why are you taking 11 shots? Like, I, I'd like to see him take ah. over 17 shots, especially when Kawhi is out. But, again, I talk about kind of the, the, the morale of the team and the vibe. Clippers right now seem to be figuring out. They're starting to win some games. And that's kind of the attitude. That's the momentum and the positivity you want at this point of the season going into the postseason. Um, you obviously want to get Kawhi healthy because he's their chance to be a real contender. But this is a big one. This is a, a, a nice comeback win. This is a feel. They feel good today at the facility. Lou, this is your team. I mean, for a while there, we're starting to think it, it doesn't look good. How are you feeling now? Yeah, I'm, I'm still rolling. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my, my little brothers, uh, Amir Coffey, having an opportunity to play and making a big impact on the offensive defensive end. And Terrence Mann has always been uh, one of those guys where he's a, he's, a, he's a glue type of player. You know, he's just one of those guys that's going to go out there 
and and find ways to impact the game positively. And so for them to be a big part of that run, I I, I was personally proud. That's why I had the big smile on my face. But <laughs> I still like I still like this team in the West when it comes down to it. When it comes down to being healthy and having all of your pieces. And if somebody go down, still being able to afford an injury or two here and there, the Clippers are that basketball team. They're deep enough to have to be able to go through some adversity and still be able to survive everything. So I still like them in the West. What about this Cavs team? They've lost three in a row. Again, worst possible timing to start looking like you're falling apart, Chandler. Are we thinking first round exit? What's more likely for them? It's tough because it's so tough and we didn't touch on it, but it's crazy because the Orlando magic are just sneakily 46 and 32 and they're a yeah. half their game behind the Milwaukee bucks. Guess who they played two more times this week, the Milwaukee. Um, bucks. So they have a chance to literally go up there and sneak that second seed, but the Cavs is tough. No matter who they play, it's going to be tough. It looks like it's going to be New York right now, but there's still Orlando, New York and Cleveland. They're a half game away from each other. So there's still a lot of shifting that could happen, but same thing with them. They need Donovan Mitchell healthy, just as the, the Clippers need Kawhi Leonard, just as other teams need the guy. They do have a lot of pieces. I do like the additions. I thought they would have a much better season, but they've obviously been up and down and inconsistent mm -hmm. with this year. I kind of saw them in the two or three spot, you know, go, this time of year is what I would predict. Um, but yeah, the series against the Knicks is, is not going to be easy. Can they pull it off? Yeah, I'm giving them a fighting chance for sure. But the way Jalen Brunson is playing, I, I, I trust him more uh, right now than I trust this Cleveland Cavaliers team. Yeah, they were on such a tear for a while there, though, was that stretch. Um, my opinion, the game of the night is up next. Sixers at San Antonio. This one was fun. Who knew? Fun. I didn't have this on my docket for yesterday. Uh, Tyrese Maxey, career high. 52. Uh, it was a double overtime game win for Philly. He was not efficient. He went 19 of 41, two of 10 from three, but he was 12 of 12 from the line. And uh, it is his third 50 point game of the season. No Embiid in this one, Chandler. So how impressed are you by what Maxi continues to do? I'm super impressed. This is what I want to see James Harden do when Kawhi Leonard's out. I want to see him take 41 shots. This is what they have to <laughs> them to win. He took 41 shots. He did. It's great. And that's exactly <laughs> what they needed for them to win the game. You know that you're going to have Joel back. You know you're going to have to monitor his minutes and his health going forward. But outside of Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey, he's the guy. He, he has been an unbelievable, um, you know, possibly most improved player this year. He has become a household name. He's an all-star. You have the green light to go and take 40 plus shots when your big fella is out and you are trying to rise in the rankings the final week of the season. So this was super impressive. I don't care that it was inefficient. Kelly Oubre also played good, chipping in 26, but I don't know, man. I'll take out. a 19 and 40. I'll take a 19 out of 41. That's efficient to me. I don't know. That's, no, that's yeah, it's more I'm efficient. saying it's harder to actually it's harder to take the 40 shots than to actually go 50%. Or made 20 shots, Michelle. That's 20, that's 20 made shots, basically. That's the official. I'm just thinking of his arms. All of fame percentage. All of fame percentage is what he shot last night. That, that's okay, fine. If you want to look at it like that. It's just if you think about the 40. By the way, what is this? He's the first player to score 50 in high school and the NBA in the same arena. That's a weird little piece they're of really, trivia that is. They're really going for it. With the yeah, they're, they're going for it. it. They're going, no, that's, out of that's what even, trivia is about. I bet you that's not even right. I guarantee you someone else did that. What do you, what, oh, no, you're, you're arguing right. that somebody. I, get, I guarantee you like someone in high school did that. And another, you know what I mean? I, I, I feel like that's such a reach of a stat. Okay, well, we'll spend the next week trying to figure out if we can put our guys on it. Put our guys this, on yeah, it. Yeah, put a research, get on it, please. Um, sticking with the Sixers for a second here. They won five straight, sit their seventh right now, which is kind of crazy. A game behind the Pacers. Um, Hey, well, let, me, let me read you their schedule. Pistons, Magic, Nets, all at home. So, easy question. Yeah. Do they win out and secure that sixth spot, Lou? Yeah. I, wow. Two of those teams, all right. Yeah, because yeah, to me, two of those teams are already done. Um, they're already packing up. They're, they're, they're in. They're in. They're in. Get out of the. Get out of the season healthy mode. So you know we won't have a, a summer of rehabbing. And Orlando Magic, you know, they're still in a playoff run. But like I said, when you have Joel Embiid back and you're trying to make a run for something, I like the 76ers team over a lot of teams coming out of the West, including Orlando Magic, as well as their plan. So I think they get these last three and they went out. 
Hmm. I don't think they beat Orlando. I think Orlando's gunning for that hobbling ass Milwaukee Bucks team right now. <laughs> the only good thing is, and we didn't touch this on Milwaukee, they play the Celtics, the Magic twice, and the Thunder. The Celtics don't care, right? So, like, that sounds like a crazy schedule, but the Celtics right. and the Thunder, they pretty much they know where they're going to fall, right? So, those aren't the, the hard part is the Magic twice, the teams that still have some shifting, still have some moving up or moving down to do. So the Sixers are in a good spot. The fact that they're all in home is great. The fact that they have Joel Embiid back is great. Um, well, but this is a team. The Thunder can still move, Chandler. I mean, it's it's tough, but they technically it may, could it move. may matter to the Thunder. It doesn't matter to yeah. the Celtics, though. Definitely no, yeah. doesn't matter to the Celtics. Yeah, but but my I have a question. Do the Celtics view tomorrow's game in Milwaukee as like? Yeah, if we win and Orlando win, like we have a chance to move Milwaukee down to three or four, and we don't have to face them in or actually win, like, like no, is, the, is there any motivation early. like that? Yeah. Yeah. Do y'all think about I that? I don't think they're scared. They're home court all the way through, regardless. You know, That's if true. they keep winning, they're home. They're home court all the way through. I don't think they're worried about anybody, honestly. I'll tell you this, though. The most intense game of this whole postseason is probably going to be that 7-8 Eastern Conference I mean, play-in. I think it's going to be the nobody, play-ins on both sides. I do, too. Because nobody – they want to win that game. game and be that two-seed and play Milwaukee or Orlando. That play-in first game, whether it's Sixers and Pacers, Sixers and Heat, that game is going to be intense because nobody wants the Celtics smoke first round. No, just put that off to the last minute if you possibly can. Chandler, don't worry. We're going to talk some Mavs here. It, it's kind of crazy what these two dudes have been doing. And they seem to actually like each other, get along. But Kyrie had a season-high 48. Luka had 37, 12 assists, 9 rebounds. And 25 of Kyrie's uh, points were in the fourth quarter and overtime. Uh, they beat Houston. Officially official now. They're out. Um, but they embraced at the end of this one. We, You know, they just seem to be... I don't really liking each other, Lou. Are we surprised at all? Considering where we were in the Kyrie Irving story for a while there, and now we get to see this moment. What do you think? Yeah, we love a good bromance in sports, right? <laughs> we love when guys are getting along and playing well together. But listen, this one-two punch is going to be dangerous. This is this is exciting. This is we're finally getting to the point of the season where all of these storylines and everything that's happening is starting to make sense. Dallas were, were limping for a while in this season. They figured it out and put themselves in a great position for, for a nice 4-5 or five matchup uh, coming up here if they can stay in that spot. And so having these guys clicking and being on the same page at this time of year is priceless. It's, it's going to pay dividends, and it's going to be exciting to watch. Yeah, I, it, again, this 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 duo just it's 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 working, and they're they found a balance on when to take turns on on how to play in transition, how to play in the half court offense. I've talked all year long. This is the deepest. This is the most balanced team Luca's had, and Kyrie Irving's the best player Luca's ever played with. So that that alone makes it this much easier. And yeah, looking at the standings. The way Luca torches the Clippers year in, year out, I love the Mavs in this first round matchup. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be probably the best series of all here. Um, but yeah, when you have the the, the offensive like fire, that one. when you have you the what? offensive firepower <laughs> like Kyrie and Luca and these guys doing this together. And by the way, the first quarter looked ugly. They were down 42 to 27 in the first quarter and just completely flipped the script, completely do what, did what they did that what was working. And these two guys, they score in so many different ways too. You can't, it's kind of like that Suns kind of look where, damn, are we going to double team KD today? Cause then book's going to go crazy. Are we going to blitz book and pick and rolls? Because then we're going to leave KD alone on the ISO. You can't really guard both. And there's not two guys on any team that can shut these two guys down, which is funny because when you think about it, the two guys that should be able to are Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, who are possibly who they're going to face in the first round. Oh. Uh, but this is just an exciting team. They're really fun to watch. They can, they can shoot the ball. They can score. And they are, it's, it's, it's a, it's the deepest team Luke has ever had. This, I can't wait. This whole first round is going to be insane. And speaking of, why don't we go to the two teams in the West that again, who the hell knows what's going to happen? Lakers and Warriors. So yeah, we got we got that week left here. The Lakers right now ninth. They've won nine of their last eleven. Warriors, of course, tenth. They've won seven of their last eight. Uh, Lakers a half game back of the Kings. That's where we got to concentrate for eighth with three games remaining. And the Warriors are one and a half back of the Lakers with four games left. So there is a world in which these both could advance in that top eight. So I ask you, what is more likely? Or do you see a world, Lou, in which that does happen? For a while there, it felt mathematically like uh, it couldn't, but here we are. For me, I feel like it's, it's going to be one or the other. 
they're going to run oh. into each other at that nine ten matchup as it, as it stands. You know, this who these both of these teams have been all season. It looks like that's what it's going to come down to. So I don't see a scenario where both get in and these 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 uh, the standings change any. You know, especially with with these games dwindling down to the last three or four. I think it it, it stands as it as it remains right now, and they're going to have to face each other in that first play in game. It's going to be one or the other. When it comes to one game, if I'm picking the Lakers or the Golden State Warriors, I'm going to still have to pick the uh, the L.A. Lakers for this one. I, I think they're just more equipped for the moment at this at this point of the season, and they move on. So I hate Come to on, say Chandler, it. But make I, it interesting. Tell, tell me they're going to – tell me the Lakers take up the Kings and we get an actual world in which they, they both go after the it's start. It's possible. There's, there's just enough time, but I'm with Lou. I, I don't see it. I, I would rather that. I'd rather the Lakers and the Warriors there in that 7-8 and seed than the Sacramento Kings and New Orleans. I think that'd be great for the league. I think it'd be a better – for TV, I think it'd be better for ratings. It'd be better for everything. I just don't see it happening. But again, that 9-10 matchup, that, that's going to be something. Because now we're talking about two legendary organizations. We're talking about two of the greatest players of all time. And and it's going to be an exciting play. And I'm I, again, the play-in has, has just worked, man. It's it's so exciting. <laughs> I, love it. I hated it at first. Just like the in-season tournament, I hated. Play-in works. And this is going to be an electric game. Um, and I'd have to take the Lakers, too. I know all I could think about is when LeBron was like, whoever came up with the plan should be fired. That might be one of the yeah. few times where his basketball opinion might not have been right. Most wrong. <laughs> he's, probably, he's probably needed it more than anybody at this point. And, and yeah. it's worked for him. It's completely worked for him. Um, Shams, the Lakers did lose to Minnesota last night. Do we have any updates on where Cat is in, in his progress? Great news for Carl Anthony Towns. He participated in his first team scrimmage on Sunday mm -hmm. since that March 4th absence that he's had with that torn meniscus. Anthony Edwards said post-game in his interview, Carl Anthony Towns will be back. Cat will be back is the exact words. Indeed, I'm told he is very, very close to returning to action. The Timberwolves have four games this week at home against the Wizards on Tuesday, then on the road Wednesday in a back-to-back -back against the Nuggets, and then back at home for two to finish uh, the season, Friday against Atlanta and Sunday against Phoenix. There is optimism that Carl Anthony Towns will play before the playoffs starts. And so that gives him, you know, a four-game window here. Let's see when he makes his return. But obviously great news. I, I don't think the Timberwolves, when that injury happened, expected him to come back. But he's been working out, progressing. Obviously, you have to work extremely hard with that torn meniscus after surgery to get back on the floor in just a little over a month. Ooh, it's crazy. Denver are back to healing. back? What? What's that? Yeah. I said, it's crazy how quick these cats are healing. I, it's insane. No pun intended. Yeah. Okay. It used to be season ending. The fact that, and by the way, even if Carl Anthony Towns, just the fact that he's coming back and he's going to be on the floor and he plays 15 to 20 minutes gives the Timberwolves that much more and that much of a boost of a confidence uh, just to have their guy back. So this is huge for the Timberwolves going into the postseason. The crazy ending of schedule. Speaking of, we've got uh, we've got more schedule looking right now because the Pelicans and the Suns also play. There's a big one. Uh, New Orleans wins it, 113-105. You got 31 from CJ, 29 from Zion. Both teams sitting with a 46 and 32 record. Suns right now have the tiebreaker, and they both have four remaining. Well, we can show you these schedules, Chandler, when I ask you this, because I'm asking who's finishing with the better record. So for a point of of Reference here, New Orleans plays at Portland, at Sacramento, at Golden State, then they play the Lakers. Phoenix plays at the Clippers, then the Clippers at Holmes, at Sacramento, at Minnesota. Damn, somebody hates the Suns. Okay, <laughs> what are you thinking? I mean, I can see them both going two and two, and it depends on... Uh, the Pelicans' schedule is easier, uh, so, yep. and, they just beat, and they just beat them, so I'd, yeah. have to take, I'd have to take the Pelicans, but... If I take this team and this, you know, this question in a series or like a play in, I I swear I'd still ride with the Suns. I still think they have more, which is crazy because they're fully healthy last night. They finally had a big game from all three guys: twenty three from Durant, twenty five from Booker, thirty three from Bradley Beal, and then they give up, you know, thirty one to CJ and let Zion go off for damn near triple double and still find a way to lose the game. So they're still confusing me, and I still and I still believe in them somehow, but. 
I think New Orleans finishes with a higher record. It's going to be an interesting situation again. Come play in. <laughs> cannot wait. I, I see it. I see it the opposite channel of New Orleans playing their last three out of four games. They're playing teams that these games matter. They're going to get some, they're going to get some tough runs right here. They're going to play against three really, really motivated teams, the Sacramento Kings, Golden State, and LA Lakers. I think with Phoenix with the two Clipper games, the Clippers are basically going to be in going to be in fourth or fifth. You know, they're obviously playing for a home court advantage. They're going to want to stay in their fourth spot. But other than that, they have the leeway to kind of rest rest some guys one or, one of the two of these games. Sacramento, like I said, that's going to be a challenge. Minnesota is going to be a challenge trying to work uh cat back in the cat back in, but I think this road is a little bit more difficult for the New Orleans Pelicans their last wow. 3 out of 4. So I like I like Phoenix, Phoenix finishing better with a better record than uh, than New Orleans. And it is true. Like these these last couple of games, we have no idea who's going to be resting, who's going to play, who cares what seed, you know what I mean? So these games are yep. going to be really unpredictable and hard to tell. Oh, it's going to be fun for your gambling, Chandler. Let us know how that all works okay. out at the end of the week. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Shams with the news, John Calipari, and where? Is Caitlin Clark rank all time when Run It Back returns? Run it back. Run it back. Ooh, Shams delving into the world of college hoops. All right. What happened? John Calipari switching teams. Why, what, how, what's going on? John Calipari out at Kentucky. He's nearing a massive new deal at the University of Arkansas, the Arkansas Razorbacks. His time was out in Kentucky. It was done. Um, 15 seasons there, Michelle. They have not made it out. The Wildcats have out of the first weekend since 2019. And this is really a best case scenario for Kentucky, for John Calipari, for Kentucky. It would have been $33 million in a buyout to John Calipari if they fired him. Now they owe him $0. He moves on to a new team. Fresh start for John Calipari. And in, in, in Arkansas, he's going to get around $8 million a year. Obviously, a multi-year contract. And Arkansas is making significant NIL commitments to John Calipari and that basketball program. This is looked at as a pretty high-level job in terms of the, the potential growth and the money that's being invested by the boosters and everything else in Arkansas right now. So John Calipari, it, it is a complete end of an era. I mean, I, you, you see all the graphics made right now of all the NBA players that have come through Kentucky, but that era is now over. John Calipari will be moving on. Yeah, he has contributed billions of dollars of NBA talent to the league. Guys, I, you know what? When the athletic director of Kentucky put out a two-sentence tweet and said, I had a meeting with John Calipari and he will be back, I was like, oh, that's not that's not very exciting. But <laughs> here we are. Moves have been made, guys. Chandler, right time, right place? Yeah, like like Sean just said, the, the, it kind of ran its course there. From everything I know and I've heard, Calipari and the AD don't have the best of relationships <laughs> and now. With this NIL deal and with the money, with the with the Walmart and the Tyson chicken money that Arkansas has, <laughs> apparently they're putting together a huge little NIL pot where Cal is just going to be able to do what he did at Kentucky and do it at Arkansas and get all the recruits and be, be able to, you know, financially provide a lot of stability for these kids. So uh, I think it, I think it's the right move. I think it's the right time. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's crazy just going from a, you know, a same conference from a Kentucky to an yeah. Arkansas. And it'll be awesome to see him go back and kind of see the reaction that the crowd and the fan base of Kentucky will give him after everything he's done for that school for the 15 seasons. But now I'm looking like who's getting that Kentucky job. Cause that is a great job. You hear Billy Donovan, you hear maybe Patino that, 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 that kind of gets me going to see who's going to kind of follow Calipari's footsteps and who gets that gig next. But you know, kudos to Calipari. He's getting a bag. He's going to go to the same type of town, and, and and he's got a big old, big old pot of money from his boosters to get all the best players. So it's, it seems like the right move. Do we have a preference? Do you want Billy Donovan to be the coach at Kentucky? No, nah, fuck no. If he goes, <laughs> if he goes, he don't go to Kentucky from Florida. No way. I'll never speak to him again if he takes that job. But it'd be a great job. Wow. Lines have been drawn. Okay, fair what, enough. What, really? what's the, what's the, what's, oh, oh, the Gators, my bad. All right, all right, all right. Really? I get it. So he's oh, never out there. Go, Chandler just said he's never going to speak to Billy D you ever again if he goes to Kentucky. To get that out there. Get that out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Third, third on things Monday. are just unacceptable. I get it. Yeah. Okay. What if, but what if he wants to go, to go back Florida to Florida the... Kentucky? You don't go Florida to Florida State. It's just, you just don't do it. 
I get it. But what it's if it's Jordan the best Peterson job question. and he wants it? He's, you're not going to take it just probably, from some weird... you should probably take it and I'll probably talk to him still, but I won't be happy. <laughs> you're such a fool, so full of crap. All right, moving on. Uh, Shams, we, we're all on Brawny Watch. Uh, whether we want to be or not, it is a talking point. We are keeping our eye out and there was some news. Where's Brawny going? Bronny James is declaring for the 2024 NBA draft, but he's also maintaining his college eligibility, going to enter the NCAA transfer portal, leaving USC regardless of where this goes. Uh, I'm told this is just the start of the process where Bronny James' priority is to stay in the draft, of course, but that's going to depend on how the evaluation comes from his team workouts, team visits. He's going to have to go through a thorough evaluation through this pre-draft process. When I talk to NBA teams, there's a clear consensus that as, an, as a defender, he's already at that caliber of an NBA defender. We know about his basketball IQ as well. Um, obviously, great genes there. Um, but mm -hmm. shooting, offensive game, ball handling, I think those are all things that scouts, ta talent evaluators will keep an eye on as he goes through the pre-draft process. Um, and I think if there's a draft to be in, though, this is probably the draft by all accounts to stay in. And it's not like Bronny James is a guy that's hurting for money. Uh, this is something that I, I think him, Rich Paul, the, his agents at Clutch Sports, they're going to make sure he finds the right situation, whether that's in the first round, the second round, if he does stay in this draft. And any GM that takes Bronny James and takes on the persona of what this is all going to mean, you, you're going to have to have some level of comfortability with your job status as well. So we'll see huh. where Bronny James ends up. We'll know in the coming weeks and months. <laughs> okay. Hear me out, guys. Remember that video of Linda Rambis and Jeannie Buss all huggy-huggy with LeBron? Based on that video, I think Bronny James will be a Laker and they will all just stay put in Hollywood. Where, where are we on that? Good theory, yes? Go, Lou. It works. Uh, I mean, it's, it's low risk versus high reward, right? You, you know Bronny is two or three years out of being somebody who can give you an opportunity to, to win basketball games and become a, a young talent in this league. So if you can get Bronny in, a, in the late first round, early second round uh, with a draft pick and have an opportunity to keep his pops happy, have an opportunity for him to be in a, a system where he's not needed right away. I think this works out. And like Sham said, if there's a draft to do it, this is the draft. There's uh, no disrespect to these young guys out here, but it's not a lot in this, in this draft. And so if you can get an opportunity at a Bronny James and have an opportunity for him to be um, in your environment, in your organization, along with his father, I think you do it. Yeah, if I'm a team and I have a late, you know, first round pick, early second round pick, and I'm just in front of the Lakers, <laughs> I'm thinking about taking Brody James and sabotaging this whole plan that we think they have for sure. Because, look, if he was LeBron's son, would we be talking about him like this? Probably not. But he no. does have the tools and the intangibles and the length and the, you know, he does have that to be a better pro than he was college player, but that's also not saying much because he wasn't very good this year with the health issues and what he's on the floor. So that's, that's a completely different story. But if you get their chance, yeah, getting LeBron James and you're either a, a small market town, like, you know, like, like a Memphis or like someone, something like this that could use the Jersey sales and the buzz and the TV games. Sure. Take a, You're not going to get fired as a GM for taking Bronny James with the 33rd pick of when, if that means you get LeBron James, I promise you, you will not get fired doing that. So yeah, if you're a team, that's also a contender and you're right there and you can get this kid, not play him and get LeBron James and sure throw him in some games and blowouts and keep developing him. And maybe he does turn into something. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's extremely, extremely low risk for high reward. Like Lou said, to take a flyer on him. So we'll see, obviously with the rules now, he could just also go back to school. He could transfer, he could not enter the draft. So it really doesn't awesome. matter until it's final. But yeah, I'm, I'm taking the risk of, of drafting him with the 29th pick. If that means next season, I get LeBron James for sure. I think this is Lakers all in though. I don't think another team really gets an opportunity at him. I think he's Lakers all in. That's the only way it makes sense. If like, if he goes to, who knows? Uh, small, well, the small market teams Memphis. are good. So I tell you, yeah, like if he goes to, like LeBron's not going to Memphis. I don't care what he said in the past. <laughs> I don't care. I, obviously, the narrative's already starting to change a little bit, right? Like he's already said, I don't know how long I'm going to play. I don't know how I'm going to feel this and that. The narratives and the timelines are already starting to change with things that he's said in the past and in, in years in the past. And so if he goes to a Memphis or a team like that, Bronny, I think you're on your own. And so are the Memphis Grizzlies going to be as patient 
with Bronny James as the Los Angeles Lakers? I don't think so. So I, I think this is Lakers all in. I noticed that Chandler always sends everybody to Memphis. I appreciate it. The consistency has been there all for two seasons now. We have a, uh, Shams, we have a love hate affair with him. I, I, I him. know. It's like we like them. We hate. I don't know. Uh, Shams, love you. Memphis, we'll see you, like we'll see you in the morning. Like okay, so Chandler doesn't like them. Thank you, sir. And uh, we do have some hot headlines to continue to speak about, gentlemen. Iowa, South Carolina. It, you know, the the result wasn't the surprise. South Carolina won this one, becoming national champs, third one, uh, tenth team to compete in an, an undefeated season the way they did. But Caitlin Clark obviously is the big story of the weekend. Um, she's now lost consecutive title chances. Does that, in your opinion, Chandler, do anything to what her legacy has been overall? No, because she played the Monstars last night that were 38-0. and 0. And, and by the way, congratulations to South Carolina. That's what an unbelievable season. Like, you don't just do that by luck or by chance. That is an unbelievable. They have did not lose a game from October to now. That is hmm. insane. Dude. So, Don Staley, shout out the coach, uh, the team. That's great. But, no, Kaylin Clark has single-handedly put this sport on the map. People, I played golf yesterday at my club. Every single TV has yes. that Iowa game on. Everyone's sitting there talking about it. There's grown-ass men wasted, betting, <laughs> cheering, standing up, <laughs> clapping. I have never seen that type of vibe and that type of atmosphere for a women's uh, basketball game. So, Caitlin Clark, she's 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 a – it's unbelievable what she's done. It's unbelievable the recognition. Even the wins and losses, they're going to come and go, right? But what she's done for this sport – you have to respect whether you love her, you hate her, you're eye rolling her at the attention she's getting, whatever it is. She's she's gave women's college basketball, at least for now, that boost of of ratings. You see the ratings of the UConn game. Oh. It's like the most game ever. Yeah. Like it, it's insane. What so that aspect, yes, there's been a lot of great women before her to play. There'll be a lot of great women after her to play, but she has definitely lit this on fire. Yeah, I Where don't think you, this, this. Yeah, this doesn't affect her legacy at all. She was transcendent. She brought so much attention to the women's basketball game, um, and I and I love it. Being a coach, being around these young women, we were in the AAU gym yesterday, and the lobby was packed with people crammed watching these two small TVs uh, behind a smoothie bar, checking this out. And a lot of that was because of Caitlin Clark. So. You know, she's been the best player in college basketball. She's running to the best teams in college basketball um, two years in a row. And the results show because of that. But that changes nothing that she's been a, been allowed to do on the women's side of, 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 of sports. I look forward to seeing her in the WNBA. You know, th the talk is even transferring over to how oh, yeah. she's going to be able to play to the pro level. And so with that, she's brought awareness to the WNBA. And she's going to bring a lot of a lot of new fans and a, and a different fan base to it. And I think that's what the women's game needs. So salute to Caitlin Clark for being transcendent. And also shout out to Don Staley and the South Carolina Gamecocks for being dominant as they were this year. And all of the other women um, that had, a, had great impacts on the year. And by the way, it's her WNBA arrival is already being planned for because teams are changing venues when the fever visit. I think the Aces are moving to the bigger arena for that particular game. So it's... I it's badass. Uh, yeah, look, <laughs> it's really look, cool. Think about the one-two punch we're going to be able to see. We're going to be able to see her and Aaliyah Boston as a one-two punch, be able to to play against the loss, uh, to play against the Aces with the powerhouse that they oh. have, with the New York Liberty with the powerhouse they have. This is the excitement that the WNBA needs. They need that star power, and Kaylin Clark is at the head of it. This is going to be fun. I, I look forward to seeing her compete against the rest of the pros. Adam Silver better be on the phone already with her agents getting her to All-Star Weekend, too. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Be Absolutely. It will. They, they're not going to miss that opportunity. There's no way. Uh, quick break. When we come back, we will uh, have a little That Man it Has a Family. Up, run it back. Run it up. They're running back. Run it back. Run it up. Oh, that man does have a family. Why not, Wemby? This might be the one future I got right when I said he would lead the league in blocks this oh. year in October. We got it. This is, is, he, is he defensive player of the year next year, Lou? Uh, it looks like it. Not this year, but next year it looks like it. Ooh. This show better come back because it's going to be fun next year, y'all. <laughs> That's all <laughs> I want. Be all Wimby, all Wimby next year. <laughs> we'll just all change Wimby. the name of the show. <laughs> all right, here we go. 
I mean, I don't mm. even. What is that? It's like a cartoon. We call that That's a dime. Fun. It's like. <laughs> It's crazy as this is probably like the fourth nicest play that he did all game long. It's just everything he does is so nuts. It's so nuts. All right. Yay. Mitchell Robinson. Bam. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, bye. I'm glad he's Tory back. Craig, Tory Craig's on the Bulls. <laughs> we not doing this. Come on. Sir. We not doing this. I'm just I'm saying you take, it, you take him Barkley? off the Jets. Take him off the Nuggets. Oh, oh man. God. <laughs> he almost hurt himself for that one. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, seven. Oh, nope. Not. Mm -mm. I mean, he must have tripped, though. That's crazy. Yeah, that it's was a, a wild. very hard fall. I'm going to go ahead and say he tripped a little bit. Oh, this... almost falls, too, but yeah, that's nasty. Yeah. Dude, we've seen these so many times, and yet every time. <laughs> yeah, Come on, yeah, Darius. Yeah. Like at this point, you just got to pull the ball out, man. If you look back yeah. and see LeBron James trailing, you just got to pull the ball back. Man. Do you feel him is, or do you see yeah, him? Like, what is it? Him. You feel him. You know <laughs> he's coming. He's, coming, he's, gotten yeah. so, oh, he's gotten so good at this that even if you do a reverse, he can he can beat it up. Yeah, like crazy. Alexei Pokashevsky, Poku. Oh, oh, it's clean. OK. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's oh, oh, no, no flex. flex. No, flex he's flexing muscles he don't got. He don't have muscles. I love that for him. Flexing <laughs> muscles he don't have. This is a, this yeah. is amazing. Yeah. It's like it when is, a little kid's does. like, look at me. <laughs> this person sure may wait a thing. He's, he's a 160 pounds soaking wet. Now the ref didn't even yeah. see it. The ref didn't expect his flex. That that was made me laugh. All right, Paul, Paul George again. He, he Man, got oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> that was a game sassy. winner. Meow. I mean, oh, oh my. Evan oh, Mobley. Good. Goodness, oh. sir. In his bag today. Oh, Jeez, clean one, too. Please. And he makes the shot, which is obviously this, the cherry. Oh. Shot. oh. What? Yeah, See, that's, that's, how you don't, that's how you don't do a chase down block. Well, right. but I appreciate the uh, effort. And guards know better. What are, what are you doing, Kobe? <laughs> He's effort. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Kobe White, that's that's very him. Uh, quick break. Mm. Wrap things up when we come back. Quick and easy. Okay, uh, quick. Who you got? Purdue, UConn. It's a late-ass start tonight out here on the East Coast. Lou, you first. I'm throwing a big old, big old, big old bag on UConn. Did you hear that, that, Chandler? Did you hear that? I mean, they're the best team. They've been the best team all year long, but I'll make it fun. I'll take Purdue. I think Zach Eady is too much. He's too see big. Yeah, you, you your baby's looking at you with that pick. You see how he's looking at you? By the way, uh, Ch Chandler, that. he's the only little man that's looking at you like you're some kind of a genius. You should enjoy that. Bye-bye. <laughs> see y'all tomorrow. Run it up. Run it back.